This week on The Real Watch List Plus, we're doing our Halloween series with Nosferatu, the silent film 1922 classic, Nosferatu Symphony of Horror. So come and join us as we pull you into the world of horror for Halloween. Nosferatu, A Symphony of Horror from 1922. The film follows Thomas Hutter, a real estate agent who travels to the remote Carpathian Mountains to assist the enigmatic Count Orlock in purchasing a property in his hometown of Wisborne. Unbeknownst to Hutter, Orlock is a vampire who becomes infatuated with Hutter's wife, Ellen. As Orlock moves to Wisborg, a plague descends upon the town attributed to the vampire's presence. The story unfolds through Hutter's harrowing journey, Ellen's bravery, and the ultimate demise of Count Orla, who was destroyed by sunlight. And before I finish, I want to say this had its 100-year anniversary in March 2022. So, yeah, I'm, actually, you know what? I'm probably going to be silent because I've been told I look like Danny DeVito and Marlon Brando in his older years, not in his younger years. Well, at least it wasn't Marlon Brando in Isle of Dr. Moreau. I actually lost weight, but this suit and vest make me look like a trouble lard. Well, I can so attest that I'm you're very I'm going to cover thin. my trouble lard spot with my card. <laughs> so, folks, if you're watching, I'm not covering for anything for any other reason other than to hide this bunching up. So, please excuse me. Otherwise, I can't breathe and I can't talk, but many of you might want me to just not talk. So, okay. here we go. Flip! Mine's an 8.5. And, and yours? I have an 8. Wow. Now, I am surprised. Well, I thought you were going to go higher with this one, Miss Horror Queen. Let me just say something. It is very almost impossible for me, and maybe you as well, because you're becoming quite the critic, to rate classics of this nature with a score that isn't 10 for everything. So you have to take into account what the people saw back in the day, what it did in cinema history, and now an audience that maybe hasn't seen it, what they'll think of it. So that's why I can give it a lower score, because actually, if you look at it, what it did in cinema history, it's a 10. If you look at it in the eye of somebody maybe 17, unless I know it just did come out, I heard, with a new score that has Queen in it and all different, you know, fish and all the different bands, that might bring a younger audience in. But that's how I have to rate it because uh, technically these classics we have for this month are all tens. Well, if you look at the story, you look at the film, again, a lot of similarities between Bram Stoker's Dracula and Nosferatu, the symphony of... Symphony of horror. I have to take my bracelet off. It's driving me nuts. She's taking her bracelet okay. off, folks. So this is where things get a little dicey. So you're, you're, you're mimicking or adapting a novel into a film, you're taking key elements. So for so in the beginning of the story, you see Hutter. He's being sent out to meet with Count Orlock, mm-hmm. a.k.a. Dracula, to try to avoid copyright issues. They changed the name. Goes out to meet with Count Orlock. Been told by the townspeople, as he's going on, this, on the stagecoach, don't go there. He's a vampire. And he's like, oh, what? you're crazy. No, that's all, that's all myth. It's, but he discovers a book about vampires. Oh, okay, maybe there's something going on, but he sort of dismisses it and he goes to sleep before he leaves. And the townspeople are all worried about him, yeah. which is kind of interesting because, again, you're talking about the black and white elements. In some cases, the dark is really blue-ish and the light is really yellow, a yellow hue. Um, they're giving him the, the uh, stereotypical items to ward off a vampire. They give him a cross. Use this. This will protect you. And he's like, oh, yeah, sure, you know, whatever. He keeps it. He goes to um, meet with Count Orlock, the stagecoach. All of a sudden, things get a little weird. It's going faster. All of a sudden, the stagecoach handler, is that Count Orlock? Like, it it had to make me think because I... I, Well, he takes the stagecoach, Mm -hmm. and the stagecoach driver won't take him any further. There's, like, a place where they stop. And he hands him off to this other stagecoach. And the horses are all draped in, Mm -hmm. like, funeral uh, attire. And it is. Mm-hmm. And that's the one thing a lot of people don't catch in the film, Joe. I didn't catch it in the beginning because I got confused. It's always Dracula who drives the coach, which yep. I don't know why Bram Stoker did that, but I think it's kind of cool. But in 
the zillions of Dracula films that mm -hmm. came after this, sometimes you have to really look. And then, of course, they make it a big visual in modern right. films that right. it is him driving. I don't remember seeing this all the way through. I always remember the visual of Count Orlock. Like, mm -hmm. it's one of those iconic um, images right. of horror. And while I knew the image, I didn't really know the story. So you had a hard time identifying him as right. the stagecoach driver towards the end. And then you see the bat. And that's, that's kind of mm -hmm. funny because this was a low-budget film. Yeah. Um, the props are kind of goofy, childish. And if you recall our discussion with Silent Films, there was a lot of method acting. So all of the characters other than Count Orlock are very expressive. They, they carry on. They, again, it's a silent film. So you're reading a person without hearing them. When you got to Count Orlock, Max Schreck is very slow, methodic, very eerie. His acting was so different from everyone else. And it took longer for him to get from point A to point B to give you that sense of creepiness, of the angst. You know, what's going to happen next? And when he gets to the, the castle, and that's an actual castle that exists mm -hmm. today. Yes. Um, that I've, been, I've been told from my research that you can actually go visit. Hutter is, you know, they prepared a meal for him. He's trying to cut a piece of bread. He cuts himself. And all of a sudden, Orlock is like, <gasps> like blood. He's salivating to get that drop of blood from his skin. Count Orlock, and there's this great scene where he comes through the archway. And the archways were done in such a way where Count Orlock, Max Shrek, would walk through and the archways would actually meet the curvature, if that's a word, of his head. Like literally, it, the way they shot it, it was just like, it fit Max Shrek and that character perfectly. But he was running around in the daylight like a maniac. And I thought, well, maybe it was night for day. Maybe I'm not seeing the right version. And they had it tinted. It was tinted. It was tinted blue. And that, that was discussed in a lot of the research that I was looking at. You, th you thought, wait, how is he out in, in the light, yeah, like on the around. ship? Yeah. How is he out in the, in the day, uh, daytime, you know, walking around? It was actually a blue tint. So because of all these copies that were made, you would think it's light out, but it's actually it wasn't supposed to be. And they realized that after they made the movie, right. because the way ultimately his demise is, we all know, two things. Stake through the heart, which... I can't remember. I've seen so many Dracula movies, but I know that the ray of sunlight, which you will talk about. But I just thought they, you know, I thought what for? Uh, I'm watching the wrong version because he's running around in the daytime. So I, you know, shadows and lighting very cleverly. I mean, the, the expertise that was used to create the hand that was not only going over to Hutter, but later to his wife. There's a classic scene as he's trying to enter into her room, the shadow that goes up the staircase. And then his hand, his clawed hands extend into the room. Classic scene. You get the sense of horror. And I must admit, I thought that scene was kind of sexual. It well, was it very always sexual. is with vampires, mm -hmm. but it was at the time mm -hmm. for him caressing his creepy self right. to keep him like by her breast. Mm -hmm. You know, that was wild yeah. back in the day. Yep. And actually, this film was banned mm -hmm. in Sweden, believe it or not. The crazy Swedes. I, mean, I, don't know. I love Swedish <laughs> we love people. Our Sweden. I'm Swiss, watchers. you know. So, but they, they had I Am Curious, yellow, blue, all that stuff. You'd think they were more progressive. But it was banned till 1972 wow. because of its horrific style. They thought it was so upsetting and a little bit risque. Just like, because it was not rated, so the people had to make their own so opinion. So they had to keep the clothes on, right? Debbie, mm -hmm. you're looking very oh. Count Orlockish. ish mm. Well, I'm a horror freak. And I have tons of stuff to cull from as far as costumes. Mm -hmm. I have this beautiful skull bracelet, which okay. is sterling. So this exhibits eating spiders and flies of Renfield. And then this beautiful cape is Nosferatu, the vampire. Oof. And I have old jewels and I have spider earrings on as well. So I was able to get my stuff out and go wild. So do you know who I am? Well, you could be one of two people. But because you're dressed so beautifully and you look so thin, I, I'm going to say you're Bram Stoker. Very good, Debbie. All right. I'm Bram Stoker because I am Bram Stoker back from the dead. Because as many of you may or some of you may not know, this Nosferatu mm -hmm. film was based off the novel Dracula that was written by Bram Stoker, stolen actually from Bram Stoker. 
and uh, I'm coming back from the dead to get my money back. So okay. I may be hitting you up for a couple bucks later because yeah, I'm like trying to get my money any. back. So this creative mess is called the Nosferatu Elixir, AKA Bloody Mary. Picture this, you're in the dark castle. You're in with Count Orlok. Okay. Count Orlok wants only one thing, your blood. So instead of giving him your blood, give him your Bloody Mary. So get into the mood, watch the film, make it dark inside, but have a Bloody Mary at your side. So but are we gonna take a sip now? Because I'm worried about my eyeball being poked out by the celery. <laughs> so yeah, I have, so uh, uh, just to let you know, I'm have, a, sip, eat have a sip or maybe eat an olive. So okay, the it. classic Bloody Mary contains three ounces of tomato juice, a half ounce of lemon juice, two dashes of Worcestershire sauce. And if you wanna throw in a gothic twist, find some black vodka and throw a few drops just to give it that There's such eerie thing mood. as black vodka? I had no idea. Yes, yes. What I know would fill a thimble about liquor. And then when you add your celery, pickles, lemon, olives, and I even added a little yellow tomato on there. So you could really go far with this. I particularly like a Bloody Mary with horseradish. Make it thick. I like a thick I Bloody Mary. I love horseradish. Because so, it has horse in there. Uh, yeah, and we're going to drink the blood of horses. You like that? No. All right, let's have a sip. If I can get, and I one thing know. I didn't prepare, have a I straw do when my you do your Bloody Mary. because I can't even get into this okay. class. I got to hold my stomach in so I don't show my tummy. Mm. Well. As I drip all over the place. Yeah, and I guess you can drink these at night too, not just for breakfast. Yeah, so it's, well, it's a great Well, this is a whole drink. meal. Oh my God. See, this is, this is interesting because when you're watching this film, and we highly recommend you watch this film, especially if you're a cinephile. Yeah. Or if you're someone that is maybe not familiar with how horror films got started, because this is really the first horror film. Of course, there was some debate with uh, The Devil's Castle with George Melies. Look at you with the research. Um, I am just a, and a, a font, breath of new information. Oh, I'm so good sometimes. Because he looks for the Joe's thing and he mm -hmm. finds the most minuscule little piece that he can stump me and make me look like a nut. Oh, I don't need to make you look like I know, I am a nut. So, but, uh, yeah. but, so if you want to know where horror came from, again, coming from an <laughs> era of German expressionism, if you remember during our discussion of uh, Dr. Calgary, mm -hmm. Um, watch that episode, folks. German Expressionism, an art, a culture at the time of, of the uh, 1920s. Germany, again, remember, Germany wasn't sending films out, nor were they letting films in. And you're talking about post-World War I. Yeah, their talking psyches the, were desecrated. Right, so the agony and the, and the terror and the worry of the people are reflected in right. the art. Mm -hmm. um, so just like with Dr. Calgary, Nosferatu does the same thing. Right. Um, it creates that creepiness. Um, I just, I particularly love that because you can see certain elements of film being created and then looking at the, the pop culture it also created over time. It's Unbelievable. Just, it's just incredible. Yeah. Let's talk about Max Schreck because to be Dracula, you cannot be a fat, like short person. And Max Schreck had this gaunt, cadaverous, frightening look. He was 6'3". Yeah. And he was, he actually, they say, and I don't know if it's true or not, that he actually believed himself as a vampire. Now, I don't know if Well, he, that was all a rumor. Yeah, but we want to believe it because it sounds so cool, right? <laughs> And the great thing about it is that he rises straight out of the coffin. It was a great special effect, which they didn't do in other right. pictures. And so that was pretty good for the day. He made his own costumes. And um, actually, he was only in the film for nine minutes. Right. And he doesn't come into the film to 21 minutes in. But the difference with this story, the vampire, what the townspeople thought, it was more of a big town thing when they get back to the town because they thought it was the plague. So it, re it represented like the Black Plague. They really didn't know that it was this one person. So here's the irony. They, they changed names. They add certain elements that were not in the book. I'm a, mm -hmm. And I'm going to quiz you on that later, so be oh, ready. Oh, Lordy. I, I um, might get it, though. And names like... Count Orlok was really Dracula in the novel. Correct. So they thought by making these changes would save them from copyright issues. But it was actually discovered in the German film. There was a, there was a disclaimer that said this was based on Bram Stoker's Dracula. 
the American versions, the other copied versions, never had that. Mm-hmm. When they went to show the film, and it actually got momentum, people wanted to see it, 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 was, it became, started to become popular, um, Bram Stoker's wife, Bram Stoker had died by then, yeah. sued and won her case. And the, and the film company was ordered to burn every single film Negatives. copy yeah. of that mm-hmm. movie. Fortunately, because... Back again, back in the day of silent films, and back in the day of trying to like, you know, avoid all these copyright issues and and try to like skirt the law, copies were made everywhere worldwide. So while they had to burn the copies that they had, there were already be made co- copies were already out there. So fortunately, we're able to see this movie because there are a um, lot of silent films that we just will never be able to see because no. they've been. I might say more than 50%, even more than that. And the thing about it is um, the original subtitles were lost. But after searching and searching, some restorers found an original print that had been buried for half a century, Mm -hmm. and they restored the original subtitles, Mm -hmm. which is kind of cool because you want to see it in its purest form. Film business was pretty new, so people didn't know about copyright and, and book rights and things like that. So later on, when it became very popular and moved from the East Coast to the West Coast, people started getting smart. Just like we have, I think, Thomas Edison involved in some of these films today, who was a real... I hate to say shyster, but he kind of was. He really knew the business game, and he screwed people. Right. If you want to learn more about that, watch our episode, Trip to the Moon, that we did. Yes. um, Where we talk about how Edison stole Trip to the Moon, copied it in the U.S., and George Mielis, did I say it right? Mielis. Mielis. Unfortunately, didn't get his due, his financial due. Correct. So let's talk about Murnau, the director, who was so important. He did tons of silent films, but he is known for this film. He came from Germany. He joined Fox Studios in Hollywood. Now we're over in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Another film, Sunrise, very, very, you know, famous for what he did. He directed 21 films. Eight of his films are lost forever. And do you know that in July 2015, believe it or not, just that's pretty recent, his grave was desecrated. Did you know that? I did, and someone stole his, his skull. His skull, and they found it I surrounded. Look at this. He's surrounded by candles, and they thought people were doing an occult ritual. So mm-hmm. that's real cool for Halloween. I love that stuff. Yeah, so if you have his skull out there, folks, return it back to the grave, please. Yes, please. Yes, Poor guy yes. can't die in peace. Well, when I first watched this, there were so many versions. There are two. I, I put it on twice, and there were two different versions. My version, which I own, was deteriorating. You could see the film was deteriorating. And then Tubi had it on, and it was a restored 2005 version. And it, it started with a different soundtrack. And it was a very annoying soprano in the beginning. I go, oh, this is going to be awful. But then it settled in and the music was beautiful. And the visuals are crisp and clear. Now, the two versions that I looked at were both black and white with actually no color tinting, which was so popular in silent films. And unless I watched 56 versions of this thing that are out there, I have really never seen it tinted. You talked about a little bit of blue or a little bit of yellow. None of the ones I watched yeah, had I've that. Seen one. I've actually, that's, no, I, 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 saw I totally one. believe you. One million mm-hmm. percent, because that's the thing. With these old movies, you could watch them again, and the timing is different. Right. In uh, another film we did, Intolerance, we have to refer back because we are talking about silence. The running time was different according to where you looked because they edited it. They had a longer version. It was kind of like director's cuts now where you never see a director's cut unless you have a DVD that you want to go on the menu and hit the director's cut, which is like James Cameron. He'll make a movie. It'd be 12 hours long if he could do it, you know? And you can all find this on YouTube, which is actually really interesting because it's public domain. Right. There's so many different versions out there, so many different soundtracks. And you really got to pick and choose because I, I know when I first looked, I found one that didn't have any soundtrack behind it. And, it, and I'm like, this is weird. <laughs> yeah. This is, it just didn't feel right. And then when you found one that had the eerie music, that yes. organ music, it just made the movie so much threatening, so much, you know, suspenseful. And I moderated Nosferatu years ago at the Red Bank Cinemas at Count Basie. It was probably 20 years ago, and they had a live person in there playing, which was really cool. And then I had seen it in New York at, um, I forget, Angelica or something, theaters. That had a different soundtrack. So there's like, 
you know, you could go wild on this thing. You could probably watch it every night in October and have a different one. And if you feel like you're not watching a right one or it's, it feels kind of weird, look for another one. You're yeah. probably, you know, listening to one that was sort of remade or, um, you know, with a different soundtrack because people were making money off it. It's got to remember something, folks, because of the copyright issues that they had, they were sued. You know, uh, Bram Stoker's wife didn't get a dime because the company went bankrupt. But there's so many copies out there now and so right. many distributors making money and Stoker's estate never got a dime from all those copies that were made. Yeah. Um, you want to make sure that you're watching one that sort of feels right. Time to test Debbie on her knowledge of uh, Nosferatu. Yeah, I'm going to take it a little easy on you because I have I uh, one pickle. Joe's thing question. Yeah. Bram Stoker's widow sued because Nosferatu plagiarized her husband's novel without permission. Yes. One of the many key elements they copied from the movie was sunlight, as we mentioned, mm -hmm. was lethal to vampires and the cause of death to, Nos to Ashley Con Orlock, uh, as written in Bram Stoker's Dracula novel. So true or false, was that one of the key elements they brought up in court that's, that they said that Nosferatu copied Death by Sunlight, and that was written in the novel. You know, I really don't know, and I, but I would say if they had to use every element, I know it's going to be wrong, but whatever, every element, would, I would say true. Wrong! See, I know it. I should have guessed the opposite of what I think. So against popular culture... The concept of sunlight lethal to vampires is based on this film. This is where it originated. Yes. It wasn't in Bram Stoker's Dracula. Uh, and it was the first vampire death for the very first time in film history. Mm. Um, the director knew that he would be sued for borrowing heavily for Bram Stoker's 1980, 1897 Dracula without permission. So he changed the ending in order to, so he can say that this wasn't Dracula's film. It was Nosferatu. Shadow of the Vampire from 2000. It's a fictionalized depiction of the events surrounding the film's production of Nosferatu, mm. based on the urban legend that Max Schreck was actually a vampire. Schreck is played by Willem Dafoe. And that, I love Willem Dafoe, but when I did a review, when I used to write, mm -hmm. they changed it to William Dafoe in my review and made me look like a jerk, like I didn't know what his name was. That got me very mad. Oh, poor Debbie. They, I am. Nosferatu, the vampire, spelled with a V-A-M-P-Y-R-E. From 1979, I watched this last week. I had a different opinion of the critics, but I have to think back in the day, directed by Werner Herzog. He looks like a vampire himself. He says that Nosferatu was the greatest German film ever made, in his opinion. His vampire moves from Transylvania to Wismar and spreads the Black Plague across the land till a woman pure of heart leads to his demise. Now, that was another one where he used the Wisborg thing. Three, Sunrise, another 1927 F.W. Murnau film. A sophisticated city woman seduces a farmer and convinces him to murder his wife and join her in the city, but he ends up re kindling his romance with his wife when he changes his mind to kill her at the last moment. Mm. Sunrise is a really good film. Silent, of course, but I'm telling you, you're going to get into the silent movies. Watch Sunrise. We're in a really good film. One of my favorite silent films is Faust. 1926, a dark fantasy psychological drama. I love those psychological things. Demon Mephisto, this is a devil, oh. wagers with God that he can corrupt a mortal man's soul, who's Dr. Faust, and then rule the earth. Faust falls into the snare and begins his descent into hell. The nitrate stock cinematography and special effects are relentless and fabulous. Mm. That is my watch list. I hope it's not too heady for the crowd, but they're going to be getting into films now. Why was this film so important to film history? Well, it's one of the top, most famous silent films mm -hmm. that ever has been. It's shown continuously, year after year, in theaters, in Halloween, and on TV. It's got haunting visuals, and to this day, a super eerie atmosphere. Even with all the, uh, the films that have been made for horror, it created the vampire's aversion to sunlight. See, it's in my notes, and if I had read my notes <laughs> again read before, notes. I screwed up <clears throat> on my own notes, and I'm sorry to tap, producers. Although, it got more fatal in the Bella Lugosi version. 
keep your eye out for our Dracula version. I but can't wait for that. For me, the importance, I'm going to add to your, your list of why this is so influential, influential to film history. I mean, it just sets out and starts the vampire genre. It has such an impact on pop culture. I was looking at reviews from other people just mm -hmm. to get some information. And I came across several reviewers, and they must be in the millennial generation, Ugh. who referred back to an episode of SpongeBob. It was the Graveyard Shift 2002 episode where SpongeBob and Squidward are working for Mr. Crab at the Krusty Krab. Squidward is upset because he has to work an overnight shift with SpongeBob. SpongeBob's having a good time, but so Squidward is trying to get SpongeBob thinking like, this is not a good thing. So he tells him an eerie story. And he tells him a story about when the um, bad things are gonna happen, the lights will flicker. So all of a sudden the lights flicker, and uh, they turn, and there's Count Orlock. Oh, cool. Flicking, it's the scene where he's over the archway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's flicking the light switch on and off. And they, all three of them go, Nosferatu! Nosferatu! And it was like a cultural, significant cultural right. event for anyone that was a SpongeBob fan. And supposedly it got a lot of young people at least aware that that's this, good. And, and, it's, it, and it, for that reason alone, I think when you can insert classics into I totally pop culture agree, Joe. and get people interested, that is just an incredible acknowledgement to that, right. that history of that film. Why didn't we score it a 10? Deb. I'm crossing over the 100 years, whatever because you have to look at what the people thought, what it did to the culture, and what people think now. But I'll tell you about Nosferatu. If you have a Halloween party, put it on in the background on the TV screen because it's a great backdrop to a Halloween party and you can just look at it and not have to listen to it. And it's, a, it's just a great thing. Yeah, for me, again, the cultural impact meant a lot to me. 8.5, why was it in a 10 or, or higher than 8.5? I had a serious issue and I have serious issues with this when someone steals someone else's work and that's your book thing that's my book thing and Bram Stoker and his wife they weren't rich they weren't you know they, they, this was their way of not only taking ownership of Bram's art his mm -hmm. novel but acknowledging that there was something there to make a film with and they got screwed when she wanted to sue again they claim bankruptcy, so she got nothing, zero. That's a good so way of making the score you did. Yeah, that bothered me. Um, the ending, interesting. I was, see, I'm always waiting for the cliffhanger. I guess nowadays you're always waiting for that post end credit something to happen. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, he dies? How does also he come back? Also a sequel. <laughs> yeah, but when's the sequel? What's going on? They weren't on? thinking that way so back the, in the I, day. They weren't, they were like, no. just cut it off. So, um, yeah, so we're starting out with our Nosferatu, Count Orlock, horror. So, Deb, where do we go from here? Well, especially this month with horror, Joe, you never know where we're going until we go there. Mm -hmm.